So the next song <laughs> is by Vani, and the title is On the Need of Compile Rotation for Legacy Languages. Can we get rid of this legacy first? Mm -hmm. Here we go. <laughs> Like this. I submit it's a, uh, uh, something resembling a, uh, an extended abstract uh, to the uh, to the thing to uh, to, uh, uh, to more VMs. It got accepted, and then the, uh, it, it, by the way, if you have read it, I'm sorry. Uh, and in uh, uh, the, the reviewer said to you know to concentrate more on the on the problem to make it more controversial. So I'm, I self-proclaimed myself to be a, a position uh, a speaker. So uh, there will be a lot of uh, you know stuff that you might not agree with, but that's that's the point. Right? So um, uh, maybe if you want to give me a gift, you can give it to me later. No, I'm using one device. I'm not a hardware guy. I'm a software guy. <laughs> so speak, speaking of which, so uh, this is this is my short history. I'm grammarware. Some people call me by that other combination of letters, but usually on all the websites I'm grammarware. I've been programming for a scarily long uh, time, and very quickly I switched from Pascal to Assembler, and then went to uh, even uh, even more interesting languages. At some point, I got a, a PhD. I worked in. Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, in, in all kinds of places. We're mostly doing things with grammars, with compilers, with uh, uh, I know interpreters, metaprogramming, uh, any any uh, thing of that kind. Uh, I made a switch a few days ago to uh, to become a teacher, which uh, seemed quite uh, quite more fun than uh, doing research on your own. And something like a year ago, I switched to the uh, the dark side. So I'm now working for uh, the industry. And uh, right now I'm the CSO, Chief Science Officer of two companies, that's Raincode, the, this one, and Raincode Lab. So Raincode is the people who are doing uh, mainframe to uh, .NET migration, and Raincode Labs, uh, we're doing pretty much anything that you want to pay for, uh, which involves some kind of compilers or firms. And if you're wondering what, what uh, CSO, what Chief Science Officer is, so this is these are the usual <laughs> Chief Science Officers, so at least I'm in a good company. So, if you follow me on Twitter, if you don't, you should. But if you do, you might have seen some of these uh, uh, some of these tweets in the past uh, few weeks, where I was advertising Cocodo, the coding dojo that will happen tomorrow. Uh, but um, uh, for this, I have basically collected all the compiler books that we have been, uh, have lying around uh, the lab, and I bought more of them on eBay, Amazon, and, and whatnot. And I've read most of them, so that was my, my uh, weekend and evening entertainment for uh, the last couple of months, reading compiler books. So, uh, they're all old books, aren't they? Sir? They're all quite old editions, aren't they? Uh, well, this is the, uh, one, of the, one of the new ones, this, this one, Modern Compiler Design. And for a few years, it is really Modern Compiler Design, so it's... Uh, you know, it's Have you not got a new track? Uh, yeah, sure, but I got it in Russian, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, this picture is above another picture. This, uh, so if you go to my Twitter, there is a picture of Dragon Book in Russian. Uh, right, but uh, I have a few problems with that. So, um, uh, for instance, you know, a lot of these books, seem, even those that are printed right now, like uh, a year before, they seem to forget that this is 2017. Right? And I mean, I love grammars, I love parsing, I love everything, I love virtual machines, obviously. Uh, but you know, if if you're still battling your shift reduce conflicts manually uh, uh, right now, then you're doing something wrong. You're doing it's 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 a nice to know thing, but it's uh, uh, it has nothing with uh, uh, with what has to do with practice. Uh, these books suffer from severe name crisis. So almost every book is well, the Dragon Books is just called compilers. Uh, then there there are books like compiler design, compiler construction, and that's pretty much it. Sometimes it's like constructing a compiler or designing a compiler, but it's usually construct. Uh, uh, design or uh, engineer, and then compiler somewhere or interpreters some uh, some crafting a compiler. Crafting a compiler. Yes, there is. There is also this book, quite quite a nice one actually, which uh, is just called Bring Hanson, Hanson on Pascal Compilers. So just yeah, I'm a famous dude. This is me talking about compiler. <laughs> um, uh, so you know, for for anyone who is not crazy enough, uh, like some of us, to uh, 
actually uh, you know, buy all these books, it's very hard to tell them apart. Uh, this book is a full of uh, uh, old dogmas. I will take one of them and link them to the uh, topic of the workshop in a minute. Um, they, they suffer kind of some kind of disconnect from practice, so they t seem to tell you a lot of stuff that the authors enjoy uh, telling, in a, but uh, not immediately you know, useful in, a, in your daily life. Is that, is that unique to entire textbooks? Sir? <laughs> is that unique to textbooks about uh, I don't know, but for the last couple of months I've been only reading compiler books. Right? Wow. <laughs> Uh, and they also have these convenient theories, right? You know, this Homsky hierarchy. Right? It's, you know, it, everybody knows what Homsky hierarchy is, right? And I'm also guilty, I've used it in, in lectures uh, uh, a couple of times. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a structure of things that do not exist, right? You, you say, okay, these are regular languages and they're called regular because they're regular expressions. No. Regular expressions, <coughs> since, I don't know, several decades, they had uh, all kinds of backtracking and all kinds of grouping that you can refer to later and whatnot. It, it's, they're probably too incomplete, I don't know. Uh, and then you get context-free, <coughs> yeah, well, have you seen any, any uh, language workbench that generates, that accepts only context-free groups? And they're full of, you know, irrelevant trivia, I'm like, oh, you know, let's prove this thing because we can. And yeah, it's nice, you know, for several pages you follow through. Um, so one of the dogmas that I want to specifically uh, to, to you guys to to uh, to solve, I'm just you know putting the problem out there, uh, is that you know usually most of the books say, well, you know, there are languages we need to process languages, and there are two ways to do this. There is a way to write a compiler, right? You take a thing, you generate the bytecode, and the bytecode get it gets executed on a VM or on a, on a machine, doesn't matter. And then there is interpretation. You take a thing and then you interpret. And uh, you know, between them there are dragons. Like not, not the good dragons that you have from the dragon book, but the actual dragons. Um, uh, in, I think that VM is sort of a kind of a nice spot because you guys have both. You kind of have to have both. Because you know, when you're once you're compiling to the bytecode, you do this. And once you're processing, you do this. And, but this thing somehow, uh, underwater, they are linked. Right? But you know, everybody is doing JIT to some extent nowadays. I mean, probably everyone in this room at least. Uh, then uh, a lot of people are doing, doing REPL. They're like, yeah, you know, compilation is nice. It's, it's good to, to have a compilable language. But you know, uh, every, uh, every teacher who tried to indoctrinate the first, uh, level, uh, first year students with Java, they suffered from you know, this uh, thing where they um, need to write a lot of code before they actually execute something. So people want to wrap it for uh, study. You have partial and mixed uh, uh, ways of uh, emulating something or uh, interpreting something. You have live thing, right? You want you want feedback right now, and you want you want it very deep. You want some results of your semantic analysis on something that has not been complete yet, and the, you want them now, maybe even I don't know, in your browser. So uh, one uh, one of the claims that I'm making is uh, that this might be thanks to the fact that the focus of the languages of all these wonderful books was a bit on the on the safe side of programming languages. So uh, you know this guy, right? This is this is Nicholas Worth, uh, and uh, Pascal and Oberon has been used in his books, but also in, in all kinds of other books. And uh, he's a great guy. He is the, one of the best, and probably the best uh, language designer ever. If you find one detail in Pascal that you don't understand why it is there, you probably haven't thought long enough. You know, everything is there for for reason. Just sometimes this reason is several several layers. Uh, in. It makes it very very nice language to learn. Uh, but it also makes it uh, kind of easier to, uh, to process. It has almost zero use. Yes, I'm aware that there is uh, some, some legacy Pascal code still floating around. I'm aware of Delphi, Kylix, Open, Free, whatever uh, Pascal's out there. But, you know, the Pascal's from the books, these have zero use. And therefore, when you say, oh, this is a thing that parses Pascal, well, I don't know, you say so, but you, know, uh, you, you have no way to, to test uh, uh, these claims. Um, on, on the way that we can test claims now, with like you know, thousands and millions of lines of code on, on GitHub. 
has a very clear list of uh, <coughs> constructs and features, again with uh, very nice design, and the semantics are also kind of uh, orthogonal. So yeah. once you know how control flow things work, then hoop, you will immediately have all your whiles and tills and, and fours and, and what. So what we have in practice is uh, uh, several, you know funny categories of language. So this is also, by the way, a very cool uh, person, the pioneer of language design, Grace Mira Hopper. And um, she was the designer of COBOL and some of less uh, lesser known language. Uh, she was the pioneer in this design. She developed like the, the first couple of languages ever that were automatically compiled. But it doesn't mean that all the uh, choices that she put uh, uh, in there were uh, or are very good still now. Remember, 2017. It has extreme number of features. COBOL has extreme number of features. PL1, you don't want to start uh, uh, on the list of them. There are billions of lines of code in existence. You guys may try to, to pretend that they do not exist for, uh, for a while, but soon Java will join the same club, and then you, know, then you will move on to greener postures, but there will be some people who will have to deal with this. Uh, these languages, so, uh, starting with COBOL, they have very powerful uh, data type description. This is the reason why all the migration of projects from uh, from COBOL to Java failed. Because Java is a nice language, but as, we, as we've just heard and, and seen, it has a pretty basic uh, uh, type structure and you cannot have very uh, very complex stuff there. Uh, so there are reference compilers and they are buggy. So uh, you need to, uh, if you are re-implementing the compiler, you need to emulate the bugs as well. Um, Right, embedded languages, whatever. Then you have a 4GL, so it's a fourth generation language. So think of them as it's kind of domain specific languages, you might have heard of them, but it's kind of the dark side of uh, 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 the domain specific language. So it's, uh, you know, in, in the cool in the 80s, and uh, right now they are all either unsupported or endangered, and you know, there are a lot of companies that have their code as you know, critical, they cannot survive without it, but uh, uh, it's in a language that nobody uh, nobody cares about. So usually they generate code in 3GL. So in general, you can just keep that code, but it's unreadable. You can never uh, you can never go back there. And quite often, it relies on runtime. For you guys, this is fun. That it relies on runtime. You can play with the VM things. For uh, in practice, it often means that the runtime is copyrighted. Right? You pull the plug, you don't have the runtime, and then you you either reimplement it or I don't know, you do something. Uh, it has all kinds of leaky abstractions, right? there, so there was a question like, yeah, you know, once, once you couple Java with, with OCaml, how specific this is to Java? Because immediately this is very cool to couple to, you know, to Scala, to C-sharp, to, to, uh, uh, to anything. But in, in this case, it was, uh, you know, reasonably coupled, right? But in this case, you dealing with, like, millions of lines that have existed uh, uh, forever. And it, the leak has gotten quite, uh, quite far. Yeah, well, this is uh, less important. So, uh, the second generation language. This is the assembler. This was something that I've motivated the, uh, this talk in the, in the paper. So, uh, it's, uh, it's the second generation in the sense that it kind of wiggles between the real machine bytecode, whatever, and the proper language. And it's, uh, uh, in particular, the assembler of um, well, the mainframe is immense. It has almost a thousand instructions. It has hundreds of hundreds of macros. They're all very non-trivial. They, uh, they all have a lot of uh, uh, problems. And this language, once you want to, uh, to compile it, and you wanted to, uh, to compile it, or, you know, pr pr we wanted to produce something that we can sell with label compiler on it. Right? So it doesn't have to be a compiler. It could have been a, a, a VM or anything. And it ended up being both. And because you have self-modified codes, then you need, uh, uh, you need to have a like, bit-level honest representation of all things. <coughs> right, so orthogonal design. Right? Uh, so you have this instruction in assembly. It says AR, so add register R4, R8. It takes R8, adds it to R4, fine. Then you have MR, which is multiplication. It does the same, except it does not touch R4 on the input uh, uh, side. It takes the R5, because R4, in this case, uh, designates two, uh, the, a pair of registers. So it takes uh, uh, something that's not in the command. And if you have something that works with floating point, then it takes uh, uh, R4, R6, and R8, R10, and then puts them somewhere. 
so in the end, we had uh, we had this. This is a screenshot of uh, Visual Studio. How you can play with your mainframe assembler code in, in this. And you know, three examples of uh, things that uh, exist in uh, in assembly. Add register, right? You take you take one register, you take another register, you add them together, you have this perfectly compilable, right? You you take this, you uh, so my target was uh, uh, CLI, so .NET uh, uh, thing. You generate uh, code for .NET, but you could have done the same in the same amount of time in JDM or in uh, anything else. Except you also have condition code, and sometimes you know the calculation of the condition code takes, in this case, just as much as the calculation of the actual result of the thing. So you might want to check if this condition code, if condition code is actually checked later, so that you can, uh, uh, you know, in some cases, not generate the code that's in this condition code. Then you have execute. Also, wonderful thing. So if you've heard of evol, so evaluation in uh, PHP and stuff like this then this is what it is, only in assembler. Right? You just say, okay, that, those bytes in memory, I like them, I want them executed as, uh, as commands. But it wouldn't be too, too easy, right? So you or them with a mask, and then you execute them. Right? So it's worse than it sounds. You cannot just analyze your program and then prepare all kinds of stuff. No, it's kind of, this data is coming from somewhere, God knows where, and then it gets ORed, and then you execute. So this is impossible to uh, to compile, maybe for some very specific problems, but not for this. Right? So this we had to interpret, and uh, then we had like this kind of uh, things like insert character and a mask, which uh, you know, uh, if you're interested, I will go into more detail about this command. Doesn't matter, but it has a very complex algorithm, which doesn't matter if it's compiled or interpreted. But in some cases, which it, it's used quite a lot it does very simple things, so it can be partially uh, actually evaluated into something that uh, is a few bytes in the, in the bytecode. So I'm going to skip it. Uh, right. Um, right. So in general we wanted uh, to have an assembler compiler that integrates with uh, all kinds of stuff that allows people to move on from mainframe to greener pastures like uh, you know normal computers and uh, normal development environments with debugging and with syntax highlighting, wow. Uh, while keeping legacy code as it is and later rewrite it and throw it away because you don't want to keep it forever. Uh, runtime ablation was unavoidable thanks to uh, this evil and self-modification. Uh, we wanted to do compilation whenever possible because, uh, you know, performance uh, 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 I, I, I'm work in, in working in the industry so I don't have the luxury of saying, oh, you know, performance is not a problem. It's not a problem, it's an issue. Right? It's, a, it's a challenge. It's something that we need to uh, work with. And in general, uh, in general, so what the solution looked like, we postponed a lot of decisions from compilation of the compiler time into the compilation time, and a lot of things from compilation time into the runtime. So while the compiler is being put together, it doesn't know what is the instruction set because we also wanted to uh, support several um, versions of uh, uh, HLS. Uh, and then we used a lot of languages to specify the semantics, to specify the inlining rules, to uh, you know, do do all kinds of stuff, and generate it in uh, in phases. And in general, there is an emulator for everything. That's, that's easy once you know the semantics. You just generate a file that's 20,000 lines long, which is in C-sharp, which is an emulator. And then the compiler decides whether to inline each of the calls to the emulator. So it, at each time it says, well, right now I'm looking at these bytes. Nobody has changed them. Nobody has touched them. They are kind of, they belong to the easier thing. So I know how to inline them. I will compile them to the uh, bytecode that immediately executes them. If I don't know or if something fishy happened, I compile them into the call to the emulator that actually interprets them on the fly and does the, the same but robustly. So, you know, this is what we've done, but again, this is where the dragons are. So the compilers are there, interpreters are there, we're hanging somewhere in the middle, and, you know, we need, we need some solution. If you know of the solution, please uh, tell me so. We have some time for questions, and uh, whether you do or do not have questions, please come to the COVID. Thank you.
I think it's the old provocative talk. Um, how do you test for functional equivalence of your, you know, um, interpretive code and the original um, binary? Uh, um, in the <coughs> Uh, in, on the first stages, when we just started, uh, we basically had these microcode uh, uh, things where we could check on the level of uh, uh, each of the microcode instructions. Microcode is just our internal thing that we use as you know, model transformation, model inter intermediate representation, basically. Uh, once that was kind of made us feel slightly safe, uh, there is documentation on assembler uh, which says, oh, you know, this is a program and it does this execute, translate, whatnot. And the output should be that way. That was the next uh, phase. And right now we are on a case uh, study driven thing. So we basically uh, reach out to people who have uh, some kind of programs that they still understand what the program does. It's not a given. Uh, but uh, there are some people like this. So the screenshot that I've uh, shown this on a program called Tembor. And it has like 5,000 lines of code, so it's pretty you know, serious. And you know, they run it there. They say, well, you know, this XML file goes in. In this case, it was a log processor. This XML file goes out, and then we compare the output of the entire thing. So it's a, it's a stage process, and it took uh, I know uh, once I joined the project, it took like a, a year, slightly less uh, than before that. There was some work there. So. Just very briefly define again for me what a compiler is and what an interpreter is. Well, let me... Uh, let me no, 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 no. <laughs> one sentence each. Uh, one sentence each. A compiler takes uh, uh, code in uh, input language and produces code in uh, an output language which is presumably a lower level. And an interpreter, it takes the text in an input language and produces the result of the computation specified by the program. In the so the runtime is an interpreter, and, and something that compiles to bytecode that's a compiler. And I didn't invent them. I, I just uh, yeah, 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 read a lot of books. Sure that we are talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Are we? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you invent a dynamic binary <coughs> translation system? Uh, dynamic binding on what to what? I don't know. Um, you're old executable to x86, right? And I mean binary. You know, like uh, Apple did when they went from whatever power to. You haven't yeah, mentioned any of the binary translation literature, mm -hmm. which seems like mm -hmm. relevant. Uh, kind of. So, so it's just compilers. Yeah. Well, it, it, is, know, it, it is a map. It's that's exactly the problem that he's described. Yeah, it, 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 it is a mapper that would have mapped some uh, two architectures that are uh, uh, somewhat uh, similar, right? It's different. But it seems like that's more useful for this problem than the set of books that you, you described, uh, which you don't fit that way. If you, if you have any reference to uh, projects that did uh, translation to like really different architectures, yeah, not one-to-one, sure. not then please, please yeah, share sure. them. Okay. We can talk some about that. Mario, are there any generic EBT frameworks? Uh, there have been some attempts, but we've not been wildly successful. Well, but if the approach is sound, then it, it might not be right. su success uh, uh, just because, because you know, time for most people don't right. see. Maybe one last question on Jeremy. You put your own come out. I think it, it's your turn. So one last question. Which was oh. the best book you read? <laughs> <laughs> Which was the best one? Which was the best book you read? Uh, I think this one. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this one is nice, but uh, this one really is, uh, you know, it's, it, right, right now it's modern, so it's 2013, and it has you know, a lot of relevant stuff. And also these authors have split uh, their general uh, compiler uh, contents into two books. They have a separate book on parsing techniques, and that deals only with parsing. And then, you, and then you skip it, and then you go here. Or you skip this one, and you go like really into parsing. 
Since it's modern, does it mention the Swift Notes compiler architecture? Does it mention the Swift Notes compiler architecture? Maybe. It mentions a lot of stuff. It's uh, 823 pages long. I don't remember all the problems. As far as I know, it's a lot of stuff. Thank you. Thank you.